welcome to your own classroom. Today in the fast track division series, we will be looking at the exchange and transport of gases. And for that, first let's look at the diagram of respiratory membrane. The upper structure here is of alveoli and with this blue colored boundary is of squamous epithelium which lines the inner side of the alveoli. And beneath this alveoli, this is the diagram of a blood capillary. So in order to look into the respiratory membrane, we have to see the ultrastructure. Here we can see this is the squamous epithelium of the alveoli. This is the blood vessel endothelium and in between these two epithelia, there is an interstitium and as you know, every epithelial cell, beneath every epithelial cell, there is basement membrane. So there would be a basement membrane beneath this alveolar epithelium and uh, there would be a basement membrane above this blood vessel endothelium. So there are three things in between alveolar epithelium and blood vessel epithelium. What are those? Basement membrane of the alveolar epithelium, interstitium and basement membrane of the blood vessel endothelium. And together they are referred as basement substance. And in spite of having these five different components means alveolar epithelium basement substance and blood vessel endothelium the thickness of respiratory membrane is hardly 0.2 mm the gases diffuse across the respiratory epithelium and the diffusion is proportional to the partial pressure exerted by individual gas and this partial pressure is represented by po2 and pco2 in pulmonary or systemic gaseous exchange Gases diffuse from areas of higher partial pressures to the areas of lower partial pressures. And what is partial pressure? Partial pressure of a particular gas is the pressure exerted by that gas in a mixture of gases. The diffusion across this respiratory epithelium or respiratory membrane is dependent upon the solubility of that gas, partial pressure of that gas and thickness of this respiratory membrane. Generally in healthy conditions, the thickness is 0.2 mm, but in diseased conditions, this may change. Now let's look at the pulmonary gas exchange. The exchange of gases occurs between alveolar air and pulmonary blood capillaries. As you can see, this is the diagram of an alveolus and pulmonary capillaries. This uh, exchange is also referred as external respiration. While the exchange taking place at the level of systemic capillaries and tissue cells is referred as internal respiration. This diagram can tell you everything regarding the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And as we have seen earlier, gases move from their region of higher partial pressure to a region of lower partial pressure. And in this diagram, this concept would be repeated again and again. So let's understand how I have made this. The outer chamber, this chamber is denoting the atmosphere, then this is the alveoli, here I have shown the circulatory system, this is the right chamber of the heart, this is the left chamber of the heart, from the right chamber of the heart, pulmonary artery is coming out and the blood is going to the lungs from where it is getting oxygenated and oxygenated blood is coming via pulmonary vein to the left chamber of the heart and finally from the left chamber of the heart it is sent to the entire body by means of the aorta. So this is what we are going to see and, and how the exchange happens here would be very clear to us. See the atmospheric pressure the PO2 is 159 mmHg and PCO2 is 0.3 mmHg and in the alveoli the partial pressure of oxygen is 104 mmHg and PCO2 is 40 mmHg. So, there would be a natural tendency for the oxygen to move from atmosphere to the alveoli and the tendency of CO2 to move from the alveoli to the atmosphere. The same thing would happen at the level of pulmonary exchange. What would happen? See, uh, the blood which is coming from the pulmonary artery near the region of lungs is having the partial pressure PO2 40 mmHg and PCO2 45 mmHg and the 
oxygen which is present in the alveoli is of 104 mmHg while the PCO2 is of 40 mmHg. So CO2 from the pulmonary artery would move into this alveoli and oxygen will move into the pulmonary vein and from where this oxygenated blood with PO2 95 and PCO2 40 would come to the left chamber of the heart from where it will be sent to the body via the systemic arteries. As you can see the systemic artery which is approaching towards the tissue is having PO2 95 mmHg and PCO2 40 mmHg. And at the level of tissues as you can see tissues due to uh, their high rate of metabolic activity produce more carbon dioxide and uh, the uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 45 mmHg in tissues and O2 is 40 mmHg while the blood that is coming here is having partial uh, pressure of oxygen as 95 mmHg. So oxygen will move into the tissues and carbon dioxide from the tissues would move into the systemic veins. And finally the partial pressure inside the systemic veins would be PO2 40 mmHg and PCO2 45 mmHg which would be carried to the right chamber of the heart from where it would be sent to the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary artery and finally to the lungs. So this is the exchange system. If we see other books than the NCRT, the values of partial pressure may differ and this table is showing the same. As you can see here, the atmospheric air is having a partial pressure of oxygen as 150 mmHg. In the alveoli, the partial pressure of oxygen is 100 mmHg while we have shown it to be 104, 159. In the deoxygenated blood, it is same as us, 40 mmHg and in the oxygenated blood, it is 100 while we have shown it to be, if you remember, we have shown it as 95 mmHg and in tissues, it is 40 mmHg, same as us. So you may find these values in other books. Now we'll look at the transport of oxygen. Oxygen is transported in two different ways, either dissolved in plasma and since oxygen solubility in water, uh, which is the basic component of plasma is very low. So only 3% of oxygen is transported by this way and remaining 97% of the oxygen is transported as oxyhemoglobin means by binding with the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a tetrameric protein as you know it has got four subunits and it is a, a conjugated protein means it's a conjugate of heme and a globin protein and it undergoes allosteric modulation. Each subunit of hemoglobin contains heme which is an iron containing porphyrin derivative. Porphyrin is a ring like structure and there are two types of hemoglobin depending upon the developmental stages. If you will look at the fetal stage means uh, in from 3 to 9 months and the hemoglobin that is present is alpha 2 gamma 2 and this is referred as HBF. This has got slightly higher affinity than the adult hemoglobin. In adult again two types of hemoglobin are found having alpha 2 beta 2 subunit and basically we are going to study this because this is given in the NCRT. This is referred as HB1 and another, and another form is alpha 2 delta 2. So this is called as HB2. Let's go to the next slide. So this is the diagram showing the structure of hemoglobin in which you can see there are two alpha chains. Alpha chain 1, this is the alpha chain 2 with heme groups having Fe2 plus in its center and this is the site where oxygen binds. So there are four heme groups means four Fe2 plus ions. So a single molecule of hemoglobin can bind four different oxygen molecules. Each heme group in a hemoglobin molecule is capable of binding with one oxygen molecule. So one hemoglobin can bind four oxygen molecules forming oxyhemoglobin. And this oxygenation reaction is reversible. Means when oxygen binds to the hemoglobin, 
later it can dissociate as well. So this reaction is reversible. Only Fe2 plus ions can bind with oxygen, not Fe3 plus. That's why Fe2 plus is so important in our body. The higher the partial pressure of oxygen, the more oxygen combines with hemoglobin and this affinity is further increased by fall in the PCO2 of the blood. So if there is less carbon dioxide in the blood, then more oxygen would combine with hemoglobin because carbon dioxide is having more affinity towards the hemoglobin than the oxygen. So if carbon dioxide is less, oxygen will bind more to the hemoglobin. Under normal conditions, 100 ml of the oxygenated blood contains 15 gram of hemoglobin and 1 gram of hemoglobin binds 1.34 ml of oxygen. So the amount of oxygen present in 100 ml of blood would be 15 into 1.34 and that would be nearly 20 ml of oxygen. So 100 ml of blood carries 20 ml of oxygen. And this is where I am showing how much transport takes place into the tissues. So from this place, suppose, let me turn on a pointer. Suppose blood is coming and it is carrying 20 ml of oxygen near the tissues. So when the exchange takes place between the blood in the capillaries and the tissues, hardly 5 ml of oxygen is transported to the tissues and 14.4 ml is carried again in the capillaries. So 4.6 or 5 ml of oxygen is transported to the tissues out of this 20 ml. And during strenuous exercise, 14.4 ml of oxygen is transported to the tissue. Just opposite happens in case of strenuous exercise. Means this amount is transported into the tissues and 4.6 ml is carried out. Deoxygenated blood has 4 ml of carbon dioxide in 100 ml of blood. And now we will look at a very important stuff that is oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. And before that, there are some prerequisites. Uh, complete conversion of deoxyhemoglobin means deoxygenated blood to oxyhemoglobin uh, uh, is referred as full saturation of hemoglobin. Means when every deoxyhemoglobin is converted into oxyhemoglobin, that is referred as full saturation of hemoglobin. And when there is a mixture of uh, deoxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin, then uh, hemoglobin is said to be partially saturated. The percent saturation of hemoglobin expresses the average saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen and is illustrated in the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. What I am saying, let's see it uh, with an example. If each hemoglobin molecule binds to three oxygen molecules, then hemoglobin is said to be 75% saturated because each can bind a maximum of four oxygen molecules. So what would be the percent saturation if each hemoglobin binds with two oxygen molecules? The percent saturation would be 50%. So that's uh, what we are going to see in this graph, which is oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. In this curve on the y-axis, you will find the percent saturation, means percentage of hemoglobin that is saturated with the oxygen. And on the x-axis, you will find the partial pressure of oxygen in mmHg. So basically, this curve is telling that at what partial pressure of oxygen, what amount of hemoglobin is saturated or what percentage of hemoglobin is saturated. So getting 100% saturation is not feasible most of the time. So we take 50% of saturation into consideration whenever we discuss different parameters with this curve. So let's look at one of the parameters and that is partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So what happens to this percent saturation when the carbon dioxide is 40 mmHg? So considering the partial pressure of carbon dioxide as 40 mmHg, so we have obtained a normal curve 
sigmoid curve and the 50% saturation is achieved at nearly 25 mm Hg. But what if the concentration of carbon dioxide is increased to 80 mm Hg? As you can see, since the carbon dioxide solubility is more or affinity for hemoglobin is more than oxygen, so it will replace oxygen. So the curve will shift towards the right means in order to achieve the same saturation we have to provide this much more oxygen in order to achieve the same percent saturation that is 50 percent and what if the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is decreased to 20 mmHg then in a less amount we can saturate the hemoglobin to 50%. So this is the concept of oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Apart from the partial pressure, there are several other factors which influence the affinity with which hemoglobin binds with the oxygen. And these factors either shift the curve towards the right or to the left. So as we see increase in CO2 temperature and acidity means if acidity is increasing that means pH would decrease and these all factors shifts the curve towards the right means as you can see CO2 is increasing the curve is shifting towards the right the pH would increase then the curve will shift towards the if the pH would increase then the curve would shift towards the left because decrease in pH shifted the curve towards the right means if the curve is shifting towards the right, means more oxygen is getting dissociated from the hemoglobin. And you can remember these parameters by taking an example of global warming. So what are the things that happen in global warming? CO2 increases, temperature increases and wherever CO2 increases, there is decrease in pH, acidity increases. So in all of these cases, the curve shifts towards the right, means more oxygen is getting dissociated from the hemoglobin. Shifting of the curve towards right in case of increased temperature is a physiological adaptation. It's a kind of adaptation because more oxygen is required to meet the demands of a cell which is releasing more CO2 as a result of metabolic activity. Why would a cell produce heat leading to increase in the temperature? Because that cell would be synthesizing or either breaking down the things means it is undergoing some kind of metabolic activity. So the cell which is undergoing metabolic activities, it would definitely release carbon dioxide and in order to compensate that carbon dioxide, more oxygen is required and that's why the shifting of the curve towards the right is so reasonable here. Now let's go to the next slide and which is about 2,3 bis phosphoglycerate. 2,3 BPG. It is the another factor that affects the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. 2,3 uh, BPG has a tendency to bind with the beta subunit, the beta globin chain of the hemoglobin. So when 2,3 BPG would bind to the beta globin chain of the hemoglobin means uh, oxygen can no longer bind with it. So the affinity of the oxygen with the for the hemoglobin or with the hemoglobin would decrease. That's why the curve would again shift to the right. So this is the influence of 2,3 BPG and 2,3 BPG is formed from phosphoglyceric acid during glycolysis. And the shift basically it reduces the oxygen affinity for the hemoglobin by a factor of 26 means it reduces the affinity 26 times and shifts the curve towards right. The affinity of fetal hemoglobin HBF as we have seen earlier is greater than that for the adult hemoglobin. This facilitates the movement of oxygen from the mother of to the fetus. Means if the affinity of fetal hemoglobin won't be that high then it would not pull oxygen. HBF differs from HBA in having two gamma globin chains in place of beta chains. The poor binding of BPG, 2,3 BPG with the gamma chain is the reason for the greater affinity of HBF. 
means the fetal hemoglobin it is uh, uh, in case of adult hemoglobin the 2 3 bpg is a common problem but in case of fetal hemoglobin the 2 3 bpg can rarely bind to the uh, subunits the gamma globulin subunits so that's why the affinity of fetal hemoglobin is high now this is what is shown from the curve here that uh, the affinity of hba is lower means the curve has shifted towards the right and while the affinity of hbf is now we will see bohr's effect and this effect was proposed by danish physiologist christian bohr basically this effect tells about the increased uptake of oxygen by the tissues and how that happens let's see an increase in the co2 in the blood decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen that causes oxygen to be displaced from the hemoglobin and hence it's and hence it is transported to the tissues or its transportation to the tissues is increased means uh, what is being said here that when the co2 in the blood increases it gradually displaces and displaces oxygen from the hemoglobin and that's why more oxygen is available uh, to be transported to the tissues this effect is important for delivering increased amount of oxygen to the tissues and what is the underlying phenomena when more co2 is there in the blood then the ph is decreased as we have discussed in case of global warming example so when more co2 is in the blood the ph is decreased means there is very high hydrogen concentration and this hydrogen binds with the hemoglobin leading to alteration in its structure so, and this alteration decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen and the curve shifts towards right. So this is all for this lecture. In the next we will talk about the transport of carbon dioxide and some other features related to myoglobin.